Assalamu alaikum to all of you and a very good morning. Well, at the very outset of the program, I beg apology from all of you for the delay which was caused partly because of my delay in reaching the place here. Well, I welcome Asian Institute of Disability and De Development for arranging such a nice seminar. I hope uh, our, we have got uh, many distinguished speakers and through the discussion that will be coming in this seminar, I hope we will be coming with something which will be good for our community to solve this problem of cerebral, uh, cerebral palsy. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not familiar with this name, but anyway, I hope uh, you will have a nice discussion through this seminar. And uh, I, on behalf of University of South Asia, feel lucky that we could arrange this seminar here. And I don't understand between you and, and the distinguished speakers. Okay, so please start. So I wish you all a very good success in this program. Okay, thank you all. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. M. Osmondel, and the learned faculties, foreign faculties and native faculties. As a doctor, I'm an ophthalmologist. As a doctor, before reciting the name of the faculties or the resource person, I should add one adjective is that dedicated people. Why the talking will be about the cerebral false things and evolved things which is permanent and it happens in the brain. So a doctor not should not should be a doctor only. He is a gracious man and he must be an sacrificing tender man. And that's why I should from my side as a doctor I should thank my colleagues. Professor M. M. Mohit is asking here, Professor uh, Gulam Khandukar, Professor Midanur Rahman, Professor Shahin Akhtar, and Dr. Saki Muhammad. Welcome. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be hearing them and we'll take the idea and we'll spread the idea to the other people of the society so that the society can be improved by that. As a patient of cerebral palsy who's affected the brain does not need mass medicine but need care. So I welcome all the faculty with me short space and we'll be learning and we'll be adding so many ideas with our previous knowledge. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Khaled. Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Mondel, uh, respected deans uh, and our esteemed guest, uh, Prof. Mizanur Rahman and Prof. Shaheen and my dearest colleague, Dr. Shakib Mohammed, uh, welcome to you all to AIDD seminar series. As, I, uh, as Khaled actually gave a, uh, a long introduction about me, I'm actually a young monopoly Bangali, uh, but my heart belongs to Bangladesh and I, that's why actually I come here very often. This is my fifth visit to Bangladesh this year alone, so you can imagine actually how happy my family is. <laughs> so, with the Bangladesh Cerebral Palsy Registrar, actually, um, how it started, actually, before that, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you briefly about my link with CSF Global. So, CSF Global is an NGO, actually, that started its journey in 2003. And I was a junior doctor at the time, just finished my MBBS, and I decided to not to do intern, intern training because uh, I didn't want to be a doctor. So I thought that's the escape path, so I moved to Australia. And before moving to Australia, actually, I worked with CSF, uh, at the time known as Childside Foundation, uh, which was founded by Professor M. Mohit. Uh, and they were doing a national childhood blindness survey at the time. Subsequently, our tie actually got stronger, and I had to come back, work alone with Prof. Mohit. Actually, he is a mentor and a brotherly figure to me. So what CSF achieved in the last 17 years or 15, uh, over 15 years is that 
Um, it grew as an international NGO. We rebranded and we call ourselves CSF Global. We have registered now in three countries, um, including Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, Nepal, and actually we have one registered office also in Australia as well. And we're in the process of uh, opening our uh, branches in Myanmar and Cambodia. So that's CSF Global. So on behalf of CSF Global, I welcome you all as well. So in 2012, actually, I came to Bangladesh to do, I was a pediatric uh, trainee at the time, so I, I was very eager to come. And I just finished my PhD at the time uh, on pediatric infectious diseases. So I came to Bangladesh to do a small survey on infectious cause of childhood disability. And the area we chose actually was Shahjatpur in Shirajgans district. And we came and we did the study for one year. We recruited 859 children with all-cause disability. Um, of 859 children, actually 417 had cerebral palsy. So I went back to Australia, went to Westmead Children's Hospital. I was a NICI registrar at the time. Uh, busy life, wrote the paper, game over. But what I carried with me actually was a kind of guilt. Uh, uh, it's a researcher's guilt that they carry. When I was thinking about those children, actually what I have done for them, they had barely any services or support for, uh, for those children in Bangladesh. So I felt actually I need to do or I'm obliged to do something to give back because I strongly believe that research without service actually is unethical. So that actually made me think what we can do. So then we started thinking about a cerebral palsy register. So what is cerebral palsy register? Uh, probably most of you know that actually disease register actually is a, uh, is a, is a database or a, a data pool actually where we systematically collect details of uh, the condition, uh, pa patients of certain conditions. It could be cerebral palsy, it could be autism, it could be anything else. But cerebral palsy register actually has a interesting history. Um, uh, the first cerebral palsy register in the world actually was established in 1979, the year uh, after I was born. So I don't know th the connection between that, but it was Western Australia Cerebral Palsy Register. And Prof. Fiona Stanley, actually, he, she's one of the living legend in Australia. She started that. And as we know that cerebral palsy is a lifelong condition, it's a non-progressive motor disorder due to injury to the premature brain during antenatal, perinatal, and postnatal period. So the idea of developing a register is that we collect details of all children or adolescents with cerebral palsy. So that register could be a tool for research, for delivering services. And Subsequently, after Western Australia Cerebral Palsy Register, all the states and territories in Australia actually formed Cerebral Palsy Register. And in 2007, uh, the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register was established, and still date, this is the largest CP register in the world. So normally, Europe, Australia follows Europe. In this case, actually, Europe followed Australia. In 1999, uh, um, the, the European countries felt the need of a CP register, so they formed a coalition called SCP, Surveillance of Cerebral Palsy in Europe. And 12 countries in Europe actually they formed a consortium and there's SCP or Surveillance of CP in Europe. So those were actually the operating CP registers in high income countries. In 2014 actually we do, did a study actually where we looked at all the existing CP registers in the world and we found there are 22 existing CP registers in the world non operating in low income settings. So we thought here is the opportunity and Bangladesh being a champion in achieving the MDG goals and a homogeneous country and being a Bangladesh I thought oh let's do it in Bangladesh. So in 2014 in November actually we came back to Bangladesh to establish the register uh, which is the Bangladesh CP register pilot study that was published there and the objective of the CP register at the time um, was to establish the platform for a national CP register in Bangladesh. Um, what we will achieve from a CP register is to identify the prevalence of cerebral palsy in Bangladesh uh, within a defined geographical area, like which we call a surveillance, population surveillance area, to know the cause of cerebral palsy, or etiology of cerebral palsy, their severity, motor severity, their associated impairments, and also their service needs, or what rehabilitation services they are 
receiving at a rural setting. Um, and also, by doing that, we wanted to develop a community-based service delivery model for children with cerebral palsy in rural Bangladesh. So that was our objectives. And by doing that, actually, we also wanted to establish the IT infrastructure for a CP registrar in Bangladesh. So that was the big, ambitious goal that actually we carried, and we came to Bangladesh. And in a very chilly winter morning, I made my journey to Shahjadpur. Um, so next, what we, we can show is the surveillance area. It's not small, actually. Shahjatpur actually is the second largest uh, upozila in Bangladesh. There are 13 unions. Uh, there are over half a million populations, nearly quarter million child populations. You can see the geographical reach actually is quite large, 324 square kilometer. And there are 296 villages, 70,000 households. So it was not an easy job, actually, to reach and to identify all the children with cerebral palsy in that community. So what could we have done to get those children? We know from our experience that children with any disability in rural setting, actually, the families are stigmatized. They don't want to bring them forward. And they don't even actually have the capacity to take them to doctors. So we have to take innovative approaches, which is called key informants method. So key informants method, there is a story behind it. So when Prof. Mohit actually was a PhD student at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, he came to do a childhood blindness survey in Bangladesh. It was 2000, year 2000. And at this time, actually, his aim was to collect some data on the cause of childhood blindness. He was going to blind schools and other setups. And he was getting a kind of selective samples. Because you can imagine that actually those children who go to blind school or special education center, actually, they are not the representative population of blind children in Bangladesh. And also from the literature, he knew at the time that childhood cataract is one of the major causes. But the ophthalmologist at the time in the country was saying that we barely see any cases of congenital cataract in our clinical settings. So during his study, actually, he developed a method called key informants method. So who are key informants? Key informants are village volunteers. Due to their social role, actually, they know where the disabled children or blind children resides. So they could be NGO workers, they could be school teachers, they could be religious preachers like imam, they could be council members. So what Prof. Muhit and his team did at the time is going to a village or a local area and trying to identify the key informants in that area. They train them about the certain conditions. Uh, in our case, we train them about cerebral palsy. It's a physical impairment, so it's easy to describe with videos and pictures. And we give them six weeks time to go back to their community and collect the names and details and phone numbers of the knowns that have cerebral palsy or suspected cerebral palsy. And then we go to the community and organize a multidisciplinary medical outreach camp, which consists of a pediatrician, a physiotherapist, and a psychologist, and a counselor. And over the last three years, we have conducted nearly 80 such outreach camps. I'm so pr proud to tell you that actually I have almost visited all 296 villages in Shahjatpur. So I'm very popular in Shahjatpur. So in um, last three years, actually, with our hard work, um, we have identified 726 confirmed cases, clinically confirmed cases of cerebral palsy within that population. So what that this number gives. So the beauty of surveillance is that you know your deno denominator population. So we knew that actually there are 226,000 child population in Shahjatpur. And now we know there are 726 children with cerebral palsy in that population. So you could easily estimate the prevalence of cerebral palsy, which was 4.1 per thousand children. And this is the first time actually a data came from a developing country on the prevalence of cerebral palsy. Before that, all the data actually we had was from high-income countries. And they used to tell us that the range is from 0.5 to 1.5 to 2 per thousand children. So first time we showed that the burden of cerebral palsy in countries like Bangladesh actually is one to four times higher. And with that conservative estimate, I'll tell you actually why I'm calling it conservative. There are estimated 260,000 children with cerebral palsy in Bangladesh. So that's the major findings actually we came up with. We also implemented a tool called GMFCS, Gross Motor Functional Classification System. It's very easy to administer and is to give you uh, actually how a child uh, 
operates actually how, uh, with a wheelchair or without a wheelchair actually his or her motor ability and we classify them from one to five you can see actually from level three onwards actually they are serious form of or severe form of cerebral palsy so in our study actually we found that almost two-thirds of children with cerebral palsy in rural Bangladesh have GMFCS level three to five so that means actually they are uh, severely disabled and they cannot actually mobilize without any assist device and also one third of those children actually have mild form of CP that means they actually they are able to mobilize they can attend schools and things like that however interestingly if you look at the numbers on the right hand side is only 25 percent have access to education that means 75 percent of children with cerebral palsy they don't have any access to education is it includes both formal and non-formal and we found that actually 66%, two-thirds of those children never received any rehab service. And where we are talking about rehab services is not that actually they are going to CRP or a tertiary centers having the services. Even an NGO uh, centers or NGO worker actually giving them basic health education about physiotherapy. So you can imagine that, uh, that a majority of the ch a, a, a group of children with cerebral palsy actually deprive of basic uh, rehabilitative services in a rural setting. And we also found that this is actually interesting and striking findings. 96% of those children never had received any ISTF device. So only 4%, I, I can remember that out of uh, 726, only 16 or 17 children had a wheelchair when we went there. So that was a huge burden on me as well as the investigator because we came up with a research fund. We didn't have any fund for the services. So what you have done actually, you came back to the country with a guilt trap. Now you are in a bigger trap because you have a bigger cohort and you identify that you do, their need is even bigger. So what do you do about that? So if we go forward actually, we also found that um, the age of CP diagnosis, the second, uh, the highlighted one was 5.2 years and median age was four years. From Australia, we know that the median age of CP diagnosis is 17 months and we are desperately trying to bring it down as low as three to six months. The reason to early diagnose a children with cerebral palsy is neuroplasticity. So the neurologists amongst us actually, or the doctors, we know that actually the first five years is the best time for de brain development and by five years actually 90 percent of our brain actually matures and develop so if we can actually give them early stimulations motor stimulations cognitive stimulations then there are hope and actually we can make some changes in their life however if a child is diagnosed with cp actually and this diagnosis is an anecdotal diagnosis actually when the camps are organized or they go to a, uh, a specialist center and they say that this child has cp by the time actually they miss the greatest golden opportunity to have early intervention. And we also found that spastic cerebral palsy is predominant, nearly 80%, and there were dyskinetic CP and other form of CP. Um, unlike African countries, actually, we, are, we see that actually bilirubin encephalopathy is the major cause of cerebral palsy, and their dyskinetic CP is very high. In Bangladesh, actually, we found that spastic CP is the predominant cause of cerebral palsy. So we looked at the risk factors for cerebral palsy. And this is uh, by collecting information on their perinatal history, uh, postnatal history, and any other medical records that the parents brought with them. And we found that the major ca cause or risk factor for cerebral palsy in Bangladesh actually was uh, birth asphyxia or interperitoneal related neonatal encephalopathy. So with birth asphyxia, there is a local term they use, they call it pobon kora. So they, they named it right. Pobon means wind and kora means drought. So they actually, and they can tell that the, the moment the child was born, the child didn't cry and he was gasping for air. He was blue and he was limp. So it gives you kind of an impression that probably his Ebgar was very poor and the child was dying. And then we asked actually, what did they do? And most of the deliveries were attended by untrained uh, birth attendants. They, they did all sort of things to help their child. One of the common practices was actually to submerging the child in cold water and until <laughs> they took their first breath. So you can imagine actually all sorts of horrible things goes there. So basic health education on prenatal care is lacking in those settings and which actually adds to the, the cause or risk factors of cerebral palsy. So the, the hope is that it's preventable then in our settings. And we also found that the one third, nearly one third, 30 
percent of the children had neonatal encephalopathy. They had seizure within first seven days of life. They had early feeding difficulty in first month of life, and they had birth complications. So we categorized the, them as neonatal encephalopathy, and that's something which is also treatable and preventable. Interestingly, we found that only 16.4% of our cohort were born preterm. So this is very interesting because in, in Australia or in high income settings, we found that actually nearly 40 to 50% of children with cerebral palsy were born preterm because we try to survive like or resuscitate our newborns like from 24 weeks onwards. In Bangladesh, it's 28 weeks plus. But even though we can imagine that in setups like Shahjatpur rural villages actually probably those children actually don't survive long enough to be counted and to develop cerebral palsy so here actually we introduce a survival bias that means they don't live long enough to be counted in our pool so that 4.1 per thousand live uh, children the prevalence actually is an underestimate because if we could have provided good uh, uh, neonatal intensive care or special care unit services at village or union level or upajala level then, then probably our rate would be probably 10 or even more per thousand children. So we also looked at the associated impairments of cerebral palsy, and we, you can see that the speech imp impairments over one third, intellectual over half, epilepsy, Sakib is here, he'll give an exciting speech on epilepsy management in CP, nearly one third, 20% had visual impairment, 11% had hearing impairment. And if we look at the general population um, prevalence of those impairments, you can see they're strikingly high like, or significantly higher in children with cerebral palsy. And we knew that actually the children with cerebral palsy have associated impairments. But what we have found that children in Bangladesh or countries like Bangladesh in rural settings actually their rate of associated impairments are higher than high income countries. And we also looked at their nutritional status. We looked at their Z score. We collected height, weight, and mid upper arm circumferences. And we found that children less than five years, those who had CP, 71.7% actually were malnourished, and 73% actually were stunted. Compared to the national data, 39% and 41%. So it's very interesting because Bangladesh actually is the third most malnourished country in the world. with 39% and 41%. And you can imagine the children actually who have cerebral palsy, who have 71% and 73%, they're worse among the bad. So with those findings, actually, we're more compelled or more obliged to do something about those children. Um, so I'll tell in the next half of my speech, actually, what we have done so far, what model we have developed, and how we can work in collaborations with Professor Miza Rahman and Professor Shaheen and the other NGOs and the government entities to help and support those children with cerebral palsy. So first lesson is that the burden of CP is high in Bangladesh or in other countries like Bangladesh. Majority never received any rehab services and there is lack of awareness and availability of services in is a major issue because that's actually wh when we actually collecting the services the repeated theme that came actually we don't know where to go we don't have any knowledge that actually this is a uh, uh, major illness uh, what they said that the village doctors and even the registered doctors often tell them actually this is a condition that will they will grow out of it and often they were prescribed multivitamins they were prescribed antiepileptics uh, irrespectively and they were given hope uh, a hope of nothingness and we had to struggle a lot actually when we had to deal with those parents because they had that perceived feeling of medical model that it is a curable conditions there is a doctor from australia he can cure everything so when we went and we break the bad news that actually is a progress non-progressive lifelong conditions we cannot cure it but we can support you they were in tears and it was a hard time for me for all of the team members actually to get the give the bad news to them However, that's the reality, but we, s we told them that, look, we all have different sort of impairments that makes us disable to a certain extent. I cannot fly, I am disabled if someone can fly. So your child may not walk, but he, cannot, he might speak. Your child cannot see, but he may sing. So you have to look at the ability and we have to adjust and accommodate his abilities to 
make him a better citizen and participating citizen in this country. So then if we go actually what we have done so far and what models we have tested so far is that we took a public health approach. So I was trained in pediatrics and then with due respect then I was attracted by public health with all due respect. I know I, I love pediatrics as well. So in public health actually we have a kind of population approach. So when there is a problem we look into the things and you can see that actually we divided the problem into three levels at the child and family level, at a community level and at policy level. And what we concentrated at child and family level was the personal health of the chi child, nutrition, their support for ST devices, rehabilitations like occupational therapy and physiotherapy and education. At community level actually we also feel the need for community awareness, accessibility and integration. You won't believe that actually when we go to camps, we see children actually who have been bullied, who have been hurt and abused by their neighbors, by their family members and the other people of the community. So community awareness actually was pivotal and I think I can tell you that actually that is the most challenging part we have ever faced to change. And at, of course at policy level, I'm very proud to say that actually being a Bangla, Bengali, uh, that our government actually is doing their best to support children with disability. And I think Professor Shahin has a lot to say. Next slide, please. So first thing we did was early intervention. So as I said, actually, that we, we always advocated for the golden moment of neuroplasticity to identify them early and to give them early intervention. So we developed a transitional program manual. So Mr. Monzur Alam, Jehurul Islam, so they are our physiotherapist and senior program manager at CSF Global with help from AusAid, uh, now called DFET, D Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We had a volunteer occupational therapist and we have Parkinson's Internationals with the support. We develop a transition program manual for children with cerebral palsy. What is that? We call it Shishargo, Children's Haven. It's a school or it's a community-based rehab center for children with cerebral palsy. It's a small setup of two to three rooms. You, we train one or two community therapists. They are actually local people. Uh, they are given training on basic physiotherapy and then they follow the manual and we bring those children in a six months program. In that program actually there are two sessions like the morning session and afternoon sessions. In each session there are 10 kids who come with their primary caregivers. Most of the cases their mother or grandmother. I have barely seen any father in that group and we give them cognitive stimulation, motor um, enrichment exercise, and also we give them some nutritious food, like uh, egg and 200 ml of uh, milk in the day. Three hours, they feel a bit of peer support. They form a peer support group when they come there. And during the time, actually, we also train the mothers actually how to take care of those children at home. So after six months, they graduate. We, 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 we do graduation ceremony. and and they go back to their communities. And we also did a, uh, we also did a study, like it's an experimental study where we looked at what is the outcome of early intervention. So what we did actually, we used few scales, GMFM for the motor outcome. We also looked at the Viking speech scale and also cognitive ab uh, ability classification system, CSES, and DAS21, depression, anxiety, and stress21, those tools among the children and their primary caregivers when they first enroll into our center. And after six months before they leave, actually we do a follow-up. And we found that in all parameters, all those children who actually who came had significant improvement in motor, cognitive, speech, and their parents had significant improvements in depression, anxiety, and stress, stress level. So that means a community-based low-cost intervention actually is possible, is there, and is working. So we were excited. So we started with one school or Shishishargo. Now we have four Shishishargo. And we hope that there'll be more Shishishargo. And we have estimated that there is a need for around 4,700 Shishishargo in Bangladesh. So this is a long way to go. So then we tried to uh, f uh, fulfill the need for their physical rehabilitation as you device. That was an expensive task, but we we're fortunate. So what happened before I came to Bangladesh, actually there was an NGO in Australia called Wheelchair for Kids. 
So they are retired volunteers who make wheelchairs and donate wheelchairs to developing countries. So I gave them a call and said, like, look, I have kids who need wheelchair, and can you give us some wheelchairs? And they said, like, if your case is genuine, then we're going to give you wheelchairs. So I bought five wheelchairs with me um, as an unaccompanied luggage. I can tell you it's a horrible experience. 27 kilo per piece, so I have to go to the, uh, there, is, there is a place behind the airport where you have to uh, release all those things. It was a drama, two days I spent there, so I got my first five wheelchairs into the country. Monzul is here, so he and his team actually, renters actually try to fit those, adjust those wheelchairs. They are lovely special wheelchairs, each cost nearly 300 Australian dollars. So we got those for free, and wheelchair for kids, we're convinced that actually we have the capacity to assemble and distribute those wheelchairs. So in last two and a half years, actually, we have imported 664 wheelchairs into the country. And now I'm proudly can tell you that all the children with cerebral palsy in our cohort actually have received wheelchairs. So the, the story doesn't end here. So what happened when we received the wheelchairs, actually, it has to come through a a, a long bureaucratic process. So there were a few entities involved, so which is NGFS Bureau, um, National Board of Revenue, Port Authority, Ministry of Finance, because we ask for tax exemption, because we're not making money out of it, we are giving it for free. The first wheelchair container that we received, we could clear that from the port within 21 days. I was excited, but I didn't realize that that was beginner slack. The next, next container actually took two months, the third one took six months, the fourth one took seven months. And we have to count like nearly 10 lakh taka just to release those wheelchairs. So at that point actually we, our frustration went to the roof and we realized that actually we were spending more money to the port authorities and to NBR than we can actually make the wheelchairs ourselves. So I was furious, I went back to Australia and I told them actually, we will not import the wheelchairs any longer. We know that we are getting it free, but we'll make it in Bangladesh. Uh, so can you give us the technical know-how? So they agreed they're really giving people, actually they gave us the whole manual of their factory, all technical support, and we got some funder. So what happened actually, 2017 is a proud year for us. So we established the first ST device center at Shahjatpur. So that center actually has the capacity to produce 50 special wheelchairs in Bangladesh, and we have the ability to uh, manufacture 600 wheelchairs, same wheelchairs made in Bangladesh, and those are for free, actually. We can give those, like our one principle is that the, the primary recipient of those wheelchairs uh, or beneficiary of those wheelchairs actually have to have it for free. So other NGOs or other philanthropic organizations can buy it from us at a production cost, but they have to actually promise that they will be giving it for free. So these are our Bangladeshi made wheelchairs. Actually, it's not well fitted as yet, but actually this is actually how the workshop looks like. And uh, so far, 150 wheelchairs has been produced in our factory in last three months, and we'll be continuing doing that, and hopefully it will grow bigger. And this is a model. I am happy to tell you that actually we learn generosity from wheelchair for kids, and we want to pass that on. That means anyone in Bangladesh or anywhere in the world, if they want to know the technical setup of this uh, 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 factory, we're happy to share that as well. And we'll be happy to train them as well for free. So when we gave the wheelchairs, then one other issue came up was accessibility. So uh, in the follow-up visit, when I went to the houses, then I found that actually most of the wheelchairs are, are, have been used as a kind of a storing facility. There are bags and other things stored into that and the child's barely use that. So when we ask actually what was the issue, why they're not using their wheelchairs, they're expensive wheelchairs. Even in many cases, actually, that was the most expensive asset the household had. So, so they said actually that we don't have any walkways, we, we have stairs, and it's not accessible, actually, how we can mobilize that. So then we got support from Rotary Club of Taramara. So I'm a member of that club as well, so they supported us to uh, construct a ramp uh, and walkways actually, so they, those kids actually at least could be taken out of the home and could be taken to the nearby playground and they can have peer support and play and some sort of um, enjoyment in their life. So we have uh, constructed 150 ramps and you can see mostly at home and then schools and some in, I think the, the two at homes would be two at hospitals. <laughs> so, so, so 
it is to show that actually the technique and the, the people of Shahjatpur actually have embraced that. And now we know that actually many households actually that are not included in our data, but they've started constructing their own ramps. So they have this new idea now. They can construct ramps. Social participation. So, so one interesting thing is that when I was in the clinic, actually we used to see that half of the kids were incontinent and they were soiling their pants when they're waiting for in the waiting area. And the parents actually were actually mortified. They were very ashamed of that, like what the child is doing. And, but it's beyond their control. So in the West actually have seen that there are adult diapers and nappies they use for the patients with incontinence. So uh, what I did actually, I bought a reusable nappy from eBay, uh, $26. <laughs> and then I, I brought it to Bangladesh and I gave it to a local tailor. I said, like, remake it. And, and he did a good job in Shahjatpur. And we did it only for 300 taka. So it's around five, five Australian dollar. So that product became very popular among the parents. Because now this is actually they have a dry night. And if they have to go to the local gatherings like any wedding or any other programs, actually they can use that nappy and their social particip participation increase. So you can see the strength of public health, like with only $5, you can change their social capital. And I hope that actually that nappy, the tailor, and we have also gave this technical know-how to some of the mothers of the children with cerebral palsy who are good at, at tailoring. So to make more nappies, if they can make a business out of it, that is even appreciable. That means actually that will survive. So we want actually people to take this technical know-how and to disseminate that among others. So oral health as well. So with the nutrition and oral health, I, I think they are strongly correlated. And also, um, in cerebral palsy is very important. So we set up a oral health clinic, um, a temporary set up in Shahjatpur, where actually the children have some basic form of oral health sub services like uh, cl cleaning and treatment of gingivitis and extraction of the badly damaged tooth. And that service is not that popular because dentists are not very popular because they always be, uh, they're always painful. So, but I think they're helping lots of children uh, and their families to bring back a healthy smile. So what um, we have done so far actually is just the beginning. And what we have learned from Bangladesh actually opened our eyes. So you can imagine that uh, when I moved to public health from pediatrics, one of the uh, uh, mission actually was that uh, to achieve more uh, and to help more people. So. Halfway through, actually, when we were getting our interim data, we thought that if we only limit ourselves to Bangladesh, then there will be questions, actually, that what about Nepal, what about India, Sri Lanka, or other parts of like the Africa countries. So we thought, like, we have to do it in more countries. So in 2016, we funded Sri Lankan Cerebral Palsy Register, which is the second developing country CP register operating now, C Sri Lankan register, and then CSF take a leading role, CSF Global, then we did the same thing in Indonesia, in a remote island called Sumba, and then we also did the similar study in Vietnam, that's ongoing. So now actually we have, or we'll be having comparable data from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And once we have published our paper, then actually I started receiving lots of email from other developing country colleagues. So countries, the name I've never heard of, Suriname. Anyone ever heard of the country named Suriname? Yes. So, so, so <laughs> I never heard of that country. So I got an email from Suriname. And I said, like, I have to Google it. So where is that? So this is in a South American country. I got an email from Peru. They want to establish CP register. They want to do the same thing, what we have done. We have been contacted from Uganda, Zimbabwe, and also, as I mentioned, Cambodia, Myanmar, Nepal. So this year actually we have been successful in getting a grant to establish a global low and middle income country cerebral palsy registrar. So the aim of that registrar is to contribute all our collected data or knowledge into a global repository 
where actually we can look at the trend of cerebral palsy in low and middle income countries. And we are so proud to say that Bangladesh is a pioneer in that. So far we have the largest amount of registrants in our register and the intervention models and the community-based services that we have developed actually are followed by our peers and our colleagues in other countries. So I think the BCPR is the start. BCPR in Shah Jatpur, I think, is a small movement that we have started, but we need all of your support. Uh, we need to work collaboratively with government and NGOs, and we are very happy to open it to everyone who wants to contribute to the registrar and to be a part of that. In scientific trajectory, we have seen that actually we are getting data like tsunami. We have many skilled research officers like Tasnim, Khaled, and Mahmoud and others who are restlessly actually writing papers, publishing, presenting in conferences, but there are more data actually which we can utilize. So I request you like if there are anyone actually who are keen to work in public health in research, please come and see us and we can work collaboratively and we can make impactful changes in this field. With all this, I finally want to thank, because you can imagine that actually I'm not a superman, and, and it's not possible for me to do it by myself. So um, I never say I, I always say we. So Professor Mohit, as I said, he's the co-PI in this project. So he played a major role to implement the BCPR project. CSF Global is the implementing partner. They implement the study in Shah Jatpur. Shahjatpur, I have no idea. I have like been there many times in the past, but the local infrastructure actually they manage that for us. Who else? Our co-investigator, my mentor, Professor Nadia Badawi. She's the current chair of Cerebral Palsy Alliance in Australia, and she's the director of NICU at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. So she's a great advocate for Bangladesh CP Registrar and developing country CP Registrar, and also all the kids and families of. Children with cerebral palsy in Shah Jatpur, our donors and our well wishers and contributors, I like to thank them all. Thank you. We'll have a separate question and answer session in the end. Uh, but if you have any questions that you want to ask now, me now, feel free. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you, Gulam, and uh, um, uh, my respect to all the people attending, the dignitaries, Professor Akhtar mm -hmm. and Professor Mizan, mm -hmm. who I know have been very busy. Everyone has caught up in their busy schedules, but I think it is. Uh, we are very grateful that they can all come to the meeting today. Um, uh, I will talk a little bit about myself along the talk, but. The main purpose of this is to reflect on the small part of the big puzzle that I am contributing to. So you, you have heard Gulam and uh, the aspirations of this register and what it is aiming to do are very broad. And within that, epilepsy is one of the small building blocks that we are trying to address with my efforts. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Gulam and I informally discussed this when I was doing my PhD and he was a researcher. And he said, he's doing something in Bangladesh. I said, OK, he might need my help. And I said, OK, we'll see about that. I was so busy with my PhD, pulling my hair out and trying to finish, get a job and stuff. And then coincidentally, around that time, uh, Dr. Akhtar was organizing uh, uh, an International Child Neurology Congress uh, meeting in Cox's Bazar. And I was invited to th uh, that meeting. I thought, okay, I'm go already going to Bangladesh. Why not? Let's see what Gulam was talking about, and let's go there. So just three days before the meeting, uh, I came earlier. I went to with Tasneem to Shahzadpur, and and really sort of hit the ground running, because it's uh, you arrive from Sydney at midnight, and at 5 a.m. they come to pick you up. These guys are very relentless. They don't leave you alone. They're all working from the first break of dawn. And then you take this. That time it was, I was lucky, now I realize it took only four hours. Yesterday it took me eight hours <laughs> to get back. And uh, then you arrive and you see 
40 children. In Australia, I would see 40 children in a clinic in about two or three months, that, uh, because in one clinic you see five or six children. Uh, so it was a radical change for me. But I think since then this is my third visit, and what has kept me going is the motivation of everyone involved in this project, uh, that everything works with a very strong will, and it flows very smoothly. So my effort is purely intellectual and to contribute my knowledge. Uh, and I know that the children are in good hands, and we are trying to break through several barriers. So the purpose of the talk today is to more reflect for ourselves and for the senior people, for the more junior people, some of whom of you have, may have a medical background and may be working in face-to-face uh, -face situations it is about s reflecting on some of the common situations you might see in the context of cerebral palsy and epilepsy. Uh, so I'll go to the next slide. So Gulam's already mentioned the context of CP. So CP is a brain injury that happened sometime before birth, around birth most commonly. But you see a similar picture in someone who had later in life got a meningitis or encephalitis or had a fall. And then the brain injury has happened and they are left with a motor, mainly motor problem, but then they have a lot of other comorbidity. And it can have a distribution involving all the four limbs, or it can involve part of the body, and you see all these varieties. So if there is a problem in the movement of these limbs mainly, they are tight, and that is generally, simplistically, the spastic form of cerebral palsy, but then you can have other forms, as Gulam has mentioned. So spasticity and dystonia are two terms that uh, are used to describe the motor problem that exists with CP. My major interest in, the, in neurology is in movement problems, not so much epilepsy, but everyone has to manage epilepsy because it's the most common situation. And that's why I love showing videos and, and because I think videos are very impactful. Do you remember them more than any slide with uh, numbers when you're teaching neurology? And so that's the purpose of showing you some of these videos. I know for the neurologist this is very simple, but it is more for my junior colleagues here. So if you play the video on the left, so what this uh, video is demonstrating is typical spasticity. It is like you open a Swiss knife, you get a little bit of resistance and then it opens up. So it is called clasp knife rigidity, and that is typical of injury to the motor pathways of the brain. And what history you will get from the parents is that the child is most of the time they are tight. Even in sleep, there is a little bit of tightness. And if you look at the other video, so this is from yesterday, the day before yesterday, we had this patient. And many patients describe that some of them come to the epilepsy camp saying, my child is having seizures. And when you ask the detailed history, they have the, what we just described there, which is called clonus. It is again a marker of spasticity of upper motor neuron injury. And sometimes in very severe injury, sometimes the children are always having clonus. Clonus can happen at other parts of the body, elbow, hand. And sometimes the parent's mistake is as seizures. Sometimes if they go to a non-skilled, uh, non-medical person or someone who is not used to dealing with children, they may even prescribe them epilepsy medications for that problem. So that is a relatively simple intervention. If you see a child who is on two empty epileptics and it's not going to get better, and you can just stop it and save cost for them and also not be chasing something that you won't be able to treat with, uh, with that kind of medications. So next slide, please. And so if you play the video, so in contrast to spasticity, this is dystonia. So dystonia is different from spasticity in the sense that the tone of the body is more twisting in nature. It is more variable from time to time in the day, also depending if the child is excited, asleep, or awake. And sometimes it is dependent on tasks. So some children may have it more when they are eating or when they are writing or when they are playing with a certain object. And most of the tone is more continuous throughout the range of movement. It is like the adult version of Parkinson's disease where you get rigidity. And so it is important to distinguish because you may, if it is a major impairment, you may treat it a little bit differently. And it is more common in term, uh, more babies who have a hypoxic injury around birth or in those who have neonatal jaundice and have had kernicterus. Next, next slide. So if you play the video again, so the first part is a little bit blurry, but this is again another video from day before yesterday. So this patient had, was a little bit preterm and had, had jaundice. And when I clapped loudly, 
you test their hearing in the clinic, she could not, she was not responding. So it seemed like she was deaf. And what I'm trying to do with the tissue is to try to see the range of her extraocular movement. And in connectors, you classically get paralysis of upward gaze. So the child's actually twisting the head up to look rather than being able to move the eyes. So he hearing loss, history of jaundice, paralysis of upward gaze, some dystonia, and sometimes staining of the teeth are clues towards connectors, which is more linked with dyskinetic cerebral palsy. So as Gulam has mentioned, some of these numbers might change, but among the children in Shahzadpur, thanks to their meticulous data gathering, um, uh, the prevalence of epilepsy is about 23.4% uh, that they had identified till the uh, last year. And uh, of those, you can see that significant proportion have a history of HIE that we could gather. Uh, and of those, there is a higher number in those who have epilepsy where there is a history of uh, hypoxia. So it's like you take the history with, and they have had either a delayed cry at birth or they have had obstructed labor um, or they have had significant other issues with uh, being sick uh, after they were born and needing some resuscitation. Next slide. So within the epilepsy camps, this is the data from the first two epilepsy camps that I was a part of. Um, so we initiated, we uh, saw, um, we had uh, the, the, among the children who had identified CP, the first camp we saw 92 children in three of the Shishi Shorgo centers um, over three days. Uh, and um, one of the medical doctors from CSF uh, looked after them and I was uh, guiding them. And uh, we initiated treatment in 60 children. And uh, the, what our attempt has been since then is to try and develop a method. So first of all, with the healthcare workers, uh, with me being there, to try and develop a method to uniformly assess these children, to gather minimum data points about what the seizure type is and what is maybe needed as an intervention. And to do this again and again in the same pattern in the different centers and different times during the year so that there is, uh, first of all, education for the medical workforce and the allied workforce, but also then to improve and translate the management to the wider epilepsy population in that uh, region. And so, as you can see that uh, of the children we saw 92, we also discontinued treatment in 22. So it is a relatively simple uh, thing, and that was mainly because they were not having seizures, they were having some other problems and I'll try and show you in the next few slides what some of those examples were. And if for these families, discontinuing treatment is as important as starting the proper treatment for some of them because the proportion of money they spend on the medication sometimes is significant. It is a significant proportion of their monthly income. And so if you tell them that, okay, this child doesn't need medicines, they need therapy or they need a wheelchair or they need sort of they will get better with age and uh, you stop the medicine that is going to have a big impact overall and it is all about making that decision a bit confidently and then educating the family so they don't worry about that problem in thinking it's epilepsy and this is just an excerpt of one of the performers we use so for the f uh, clinic the pattern that we have followed is to try and break it up so when I see the patient with the CSF medical officer in the clinic room, before that, there is already a one-page performer, which one of the allied health workers, a physiotherapist or someone who liaisons with the patient, has filled up their demographic data. If they are a follow-up patient or a new patient, they have filled that up, and we have that data at hand when we see the patient. So we already know what they had been prescribed before, whether there was birth injury or not. So you spend less time taking the same history or duplicating your efforts again. And then we try and focus on the seizure type, saying what is the seizure, how, tell the parents to describe their main concern first, is it epilepsy or something else, and then what the seizure type is, and how long does it last, and what have they done for it. And if we had prescribed any medicine, has it made a good or bad change or not. So we try and make this very structured, and we have the performa has evolved over our three clinics, but. Uh, now that structure works very well. So it saves us a lot of time, averaging sort of around eight to 10 minutes per consultation. Uh, whereas in Sydney, I'm used to 45 minutes for one consultation. 
uh, with so it is different but i don't feel that i am giving these patients any less it is because of the different structure that we are following because it is broken up and then if we do a prescription or if we stop a drug we make uh, the decision and write it down and the patient goes it goes out and there is a person who explains the changes made so we are not using the same clinic time to do that so we have broken it up into three steps and then there is a phase of follow up next slide please so this is sort of an example from the previous camp where um, the uh, the workers from CSF are filling up the performers in one of the shishu shorgo centers next slide and so uh, this uh, this map actually shows where i am from so you see that place jharsuguda it is it is about 1000 kilometers from here it is in orissa in uh, india that's originally where i was born and probably the same year as gulam was born and uh, and uh, and that's why i understand 50% manik who accompanied me this time may say i understand probably 75 to 80% of what the mother is saying when i take the history it saves a lot of time because by the time he's ready to translate or Tasneem is ready to translate, I have filled up the performa. It's very, it's, it wasn't planned, but because of the language which is Oriya, it's very similar to Bangla. And so I understand, uh, it is very helpful. Uh, so uh, what one of the problems we have identified is a significant proportion of children don't have an exact number, but I would, my guess would be about 30% of children have long seizures. So sometimes they say the seizure goes on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but also two hours, three hours. Some parents say it happens off and on for the whole day. If I hear something about this in a developed country setting like Australia, I would be immediately calling my nurse saying, oh, this child needs some emergency plan to either give diazepam, midazolam, or some emergency medicine and try to stop the seizure. But we have struggled with this in terms of availability of uh, medicine which can be easily given and is affordable. And also the parent can store in their home. They don't need a fridge or something like that. And we'll be workshopping this with, uh, with Professor Mizan and Dr. Akhtar as to what can be done for emergency seizure management. Because some of them just let the child have a fit for 24 hours off and on. And, and we know that from a lot of data that this has the possibility of further injuring the brain. And we don't want that on, in a child who's already disabled or he may not be so disabled he or she we don't want a very prolonged seizure happening again and again to cause them more injury so it's a real challenge uh, classically benzodiazepines are used around the world people have also used some of those other medicines and it is about thinking a little bit out of the box saying if some of the countries they have iv or im used that can't be done in shahzadpur in a local rural house but maybe we can adapt that to uh, rectal use or buccal use of some of these medications Next slide. And so for epidemiological purposes, people say status epilepticus is more than 30 minutes, whereas for practically for treatment purposes, we always say to parents to give a medicine after five minutes or when a seizure is lasting longer than five minutes. Next slide. And as I've said, it, if you let a seizure happen for long, there is a risk of injury to the brain. There is a risk of sclerosis of the hippocampus, which is part of the temporal lobe and can cause further refractory epilepsy in later life. Next slide. And, and obviously, the more the time that uh, elapses of seizure, it may be more difficult to treat because of the changes in the brain. If you give diazepam or midazolam within five minutes, 10 minutes, it is more likely to work. But after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, the brain becomes refractory to some of those medicines. So then it can be very frustrating and the side effects may happen, but the effect may not happen. So this is an excerpt from one of the emergency seizure plans that we follow. Obviously. This is, uh, we often give this to parents whose children have long seizures as to what to do if the child has a long seizure, how to place them, what not to do, such as don't put a piece of wood or something in their mouth because some parents are worried they bite their tongue. And uh, I'm sure there may be resources like this that exist in Bangla. And uh, they may be useful for a proportion of our families because they may not be actually addressing uh, the condition properly because la this time we asked one of the parents what they did and they were making the child smell a shoe thinking that will stop the seizure happening uh, if it was going for a long time next next slide so just next few slides uh, just to show you the spectrum of different seizure types and some things which are not seizures so if you play the first video 
So this video shows, so if I've not shown a video of typical generalized tonic-clonic seizure, because many of you might know, be aware of that, it's whole body shaking and loss of consciousness, frothing and incontinence. Whereas what this video is showing is a tonic seizure. And that is something the parents describe. So when the mother is describing it, you see that visual picture now, but you, when you hear the history, you may get a history like that. And they often, it's a good idea for, to tell them to act it out, to show it to you. And if for some of those families who have a ma mobile phone, tell them to take a video if they can. It is not such an unusual thing now for many people to have a mobile phone. Next slide. And this is another seizure type. So these are both seizure types. And this is, as you can see, a bit similar, but then the child loses tone. And this is an atonic seizure. So that is a tonic seizure. And a this is an atonic seizure. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, and sorry for the spelling, so just play this one again. So we saw two patients in the last three days who had a history where the mother in, in Bangla described this very well. And this is something that you get a history of in the first year of life. It can be due to children with CP, due to many other reasons, where a child at a certain phase has, has episodes where they do this again and again. And these are called infantile spasms. And it is fortunate to see that even in Shahzadpur, some of these children have then been sent to a hospital and have been treated with high-dose steroids, which is the treatment for spasms. Uh, and and um, but some of them have not. They have just persisted through this phase and then have had uh, severe delay. It is not very clear even from widespread studies as to how much impact you can make in treatment of spasms. but. We try and treat them more aggressively because often it is associated with the stagnation or regression of development. And so when able, uh, a couple of weeks of high-dose steroids can get rid of this seizure type and the treatment is very different from your conventional epilepsy treatment. Next slide. Okay, play the video, sorry. So, so just go to the left bottom corner. Sorry. Just go to the left bottom corner of the slide. Of the, move the arrow. Yep. Uh, sorry, just put it in the center of the screen. Just in a blank space. Yep, click there. Okay, here, yeah, play the video. Uh, just click on it. Yep. So this is an example. Again, we have, I think, every clinic, two or three children, where you get a history like this. So this, uh, even though this is a video from my clinic, uh, but you get a history sometimes that a child has seizures after they have been upset or they are crying. And so what you're seeing here is this child is very upset, is crying, crying, and then they lose tone. And so the child is not breathing at this time. And sometimes they may even go on to have a proper seizure. And this is an example of breath holding. It's a breath holding attack, more common in younger children. It can happen either when the child is hurt or sometimes even if they are upset and they can sometimes go blue and have a proper seizure. So for this, uh, it is important to recognize the phenomenology because the treatment is different. So supplementation with iron or using a medicine called piracetam um, it can be helpful in some of these children and also reassurance that this is not a seizure because many children do improve as they grow older. Next, next slide. So this is just an example, apart from the videos, of some of the other things you see. So there are some children with hydrocephalus and other neurosurgical problems. This was a patient last time we I saw who had uh, a CT scan which looked like this and was referred for a neurosurgical procedure. But uh, this is an example of uh, a person who doesn't have a corpus callosum, which is the m connecting part of the brain. And the brain is malformed and the ventricles always look larger, but there is no need for surgery. And the child had some other movement problems, but did not have seizure and was on a seizure treatment. So all we ended up doing was to stop the seizure treatment and say that you don't have to, you stop collecting the money to go to Dhaka, which they had been doing for three year, months or three or four months to get a neurosurgical opinion. Uh, uh, very few children, although in that setting, have had a CT scan or MRI. Some of the red flags, if there's someone with a largely increasing head size or someone with a new onset torticollis in a younger child 
um, or with profuse vomiting, they are some of the red flags where you actually need to advise imaging. This time we advised imaging in someone who had very refractory focal seizures and the family could afford it because we were wondering if there is something on one side of the brain. But very rarely, probably one or two times out of the three clinics I have done that I have actually requested an investigation because uh, like imaging because it is very difficult to get it in that setting. So you have to be a bit more judicious. Uh, with that, in contrast to my practice in Australia, where every day I would be requesting an MRI without thinking about it, so it's it makes me mo better, I think, better as a clinician and to make these judgments here. Next slide. So just show you a few other videos. So if you play the videos there. So again, this is a very common scenario, and Dr. Akhtar will be more used to it because these movements are more common in children who have autism. And but also in other things like cerebral palsy and brain injury. So what these videos are showing, so you see this child trying to bang the head and this is called a stereotypical movement. It's a stereotypy, it's not a seizure. Some pe parents are very worried about this uh, but, but it's not really a point to chase th them by giving medications. Next slide, uh, the next video, sorry. These are just some examples of some stereotypical movements which are not seizures. So this uh, person, teenager, does this in his sleep. So it's a sleep-related hitting the head. Again, a sleep-related movement in this video. It's a darker video because it's at night. It's a home video. Next slide. And what you can see is a child is doing that every night. And this is, again, it's called a rhythmic movement disorder. And it is, again, the child or younger person is putting themselves to sleep, soothing themselves to sleep. So th these are all examples of non-epileptic movements that can happen in children who have seizures or, not, uh, or have brain injury or have autism. Next slide. So uh, the spec if I think about the broad spectrum of the cases that I have seen uh, with the focus on epilepsy, uh, we have we we try and get a history first of all if it's not available whether there was actually CP or not CP because some of them some of the patients would have a, another disorder they might have a genetic or metabolic disorder which may be difficult to diagnose but at least we can categorize them as an unclear diagnosis or an atypical case and then we try and identify the motor and seizure phenotype. If, if we, there are some patients who don't have a history of hypoxic injury and they are suggestive of autism or a genetic syndrome, again, within the cerebral palsy register, those who have an autistic phenotype, behavioral problems, biting, lack of social contact, we, we will end up identifying them. What we do with them, we will need the help of our other colleagues because it is not so easy to manage even in developed settings, but we know there is interest in Bangladesh and hopefully we'll have an avenue for helping them in the future. And then it's, in, sorry, go back. And identifying the non-epileptic events is important, as important as identifying the seizure and then seeing what is the imp what is the major concern of the parent and what is the major disability due to is it recurrent seizures prolonged seizure it is more the, uh, is it more the motor issues or the behavior and thinking about intervening for that next slide so what we end up doing is uh, focus on those things that i've already mentioned during the patient consultation next slide uh, and the common interventions are either rationalizing multiple medications. Sometimes they are, um, patients are on multiple non-epileptic vitamins or medications that may be contributing little. So you try and rationalize polypharmacy, try and manage it with as minimum drugs as possible and then adjust the medicines if they are not giving the proper doses. Next slide. And then educating and during the clinic we try and provide some free medications to try and give an impetus because non-compliance due to various reasons, cost, education, sometimes just misconceptions, sometimes the confusion of being on too many medications is a big issue and, and that is one of our targets is to improve compliance with taking epilepsy medications for those who really need them. Next slide. Uh, uh, in the second clinic we did, we developed this chart which uh, is based on a child of roughly 20 kilos or something and we looked at the common available and epilepsy medications in rural Bangladesh and, and in the clinic when we are seeing patients we have an easy calculator for cost saying okay if you are on sodium 
valproate for this child of 20 kilos for one month this is how many takas the family needs to spend and we explain it to them sometimes we discuss things we give them options okay you have got the option of phenobarbitone valproate or clobazam this is uh, we, what we think we should take and if the family are okay we prescribe it based on their affordability it has been very helpful the first time i had no clue because uh, i had no perception of the cost next slide and this is this uh, sorry for the small font but this is describing the spectrum of the medicines that we either started or continued prescription for the highest you can see is phenobarbitone which is the cheapest obviously it has got some drawbacks in older children can make them more sedated but still quite useful uh, the second is clobazam which we found uh, is is relatively cheap in bangladesh and i use it a lot in australia and it is again a broader spectrum epilepsy medication. Dr. Mizan might talk about more in details about some of these medications, just describing the spectrum we use. The other two are not seizure medications and then the third peak is valproic acid. So these are commonly available medications and they are relatively not so expensive if we calculate it for the weight of the child. Some of the other medications, as you can see, we've used are baclofen or trihexyphenidyl. So baclofen is more for high spasticity or trihexyphenidyl for dystonia. And this time it was reassuring to see that it had actually helped some of the patients. Um, obviously, you continue them only if it is helping. And, and clonidine is a medicine that I use very frequently in my clinics in children with behavioral problems or tics and Tourette's disorder children who are come with a history of biting themselves or injuring others or eating paper or destroying the whole house and um, and and it is sometimes very useful to use clonidine so it can be tricky to procure it in some places but it is something that can also help sleep which is a major problem in some of these children so it is worth thinking about it it's used in some of the patients with comorbidity next slide and and obviously the key challenges with the epilepsy uh, summarizing the, our experience is the choice and the use of the medications based on availability and cost and also knowing what medication does what is important uh, prolonged seizure management is still a very elusive um, challenge for us uh, in last clinic one of my the patients we were seeing had been having a seizure for half an hour on the way to the clinic and they were still fitting and we just ended up giving them one tablet of clobazam uh, orally or buccally and it seemed to work but it is not very systematic there's not a lot of data but we have the capacity to think about in a resource poor setting what else may work and to generate that data here um, and then there's a compliance and cost and there's a whole lot of other issues uh, ma management of behavior nutrition uh, bulbar safety is another problem many children you can hear that they are have got a lot of conducted sounds and mobility movement disorder management spasticity management next slide so uh, for uh, um, the focus of my efforts over the last year and then next year is to try and improve uh, the epilepsy management uh, by educating the staff involved and uh, trying to get them to educate the patients then to try and work our focus on compliance and to ensure that we have more robust follow-up because if we do uh, make a change it is important to know what that what is happening with that change so it is very important to try and follow up Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Vadud Mandal Respected Professor Hassan Shuit Surardi Dean School of Public Health in Life Sciences University of South Asia and Professor Shain Akhtar Professor Gulam Kundakar and Dr. Shikib Ahmed and distinguished audience, Assalamu Alaikum. My topic is choosing NDCZ drugs in childhood. You know that seizure is paroxysmal involuntary disturbances of cerebral function manifesting mm -hmm. as impairment or loss of consciousness, abnormal motor activity, abnormalities in sensory activity, and behavioral problem and autonomic disturbances. <coughs> I am going to cover the different types of seizure and how to select AAD, anti-epileptic drug, 
monotherapy and polytherapy what are the principles and seizure exacerbation by AD and AD depending on seizure type AD depending on epileptic syndromes and the concluding remark So that I have told that what is seizure and if we come to seizure, seizure may be epileptic seizure, may be non-epileptic seizure or non-epileptic event. If we come to non-epileptic seizure events, they are very much confusing and mimics epileptic seizure and for example, conversion disorder that previously called HCR, then breath holding attack and syncoptics and lot of others. These are uh, non-epileptic events and among these non-epileptic events, non-epileptic seizure or pseudo seizure is most prominent we face and typically they do not present with uh, uh, a typical epileptic seizure like generalized tonic clonic seizure or myoclonic seizure or absence seizure etc their manifestation, manifestation is quite different from epileptic seizure. So we need to exclude this non-epileptic event or non-epileptic seizure clinically. And if we are confused, then we may need to go to do EEG, where EEG will be typically normal. After non-epileptic seizure, if you come to epileptic seizure, it might be provoked seizure or unprovoked seizure. Provoked seizure may be due to meningitis, encephalitis, diselectrolytemia or metabolic distress, disturbances, head trauma, a lot of things that provoke transiently to cause seizure. These are very much transient factor causing seizure. And management of these conditions like febrile seizure, we need to give acute management and long term anti drug are usually not required and we need to treat underlying cause like meningitis, encephalitis and diselectrolytic and metabolic disturbances. In some of these cases there might be epilepsy as a sequelae. Then we need to manage the cases as epilepsy. But as provoked seizure by uh, we, ne we need to give only acute management and we need to follow up these cases. And in unprovoked seizure, when there is two seizures, two unprovoked seizures in 24 hours apart, or single seizure, but there is possibility or probability of further seizure is like two unprovoked seizures, then we call it epilepsy. And if there is epileptic syndrome, we also call it epilepsy. So we need to go then for the management of epilepsy. Next slide. So what is epilepsy? That is, uh, next slide. That is given by ILE, that at least two unprovoked seizures, one unprovoked seizure or diagnosis of epilepsy that I have mentioned. Next slide. So when we will go for treatment in first unprovoked seizure? When there is abnormal easy, grossly abnormal easy, I should say, and when there is neurodevelopmental delay or whether there is any family history of uh, uh, epilepsy in the family or whether when there is status epilepticus or myoclonic seizure or absence seizure or ep epileptic syndrome or attacks during sleep except benign neurodegenerative epilepsy. Though in these cases we will get first seizure but we will go for treatment like epilepsy. Next. So what is the goal of antiepileptic drugs? To abolish seizure completely and to have minimal side effects, if any. And this is achieved in 50 to 70 percent cases in children with single appropriately selected AAD, that is monotherapy. And we must balance between the efficacy and the side effects of the drugs. We must not carry the side effects as disease when you will treat epilepsy. 
Next. So, uh, that I have told that before deciding that I am going to treat epilepsy, we must exclude non-epileptic seizure or non-epileptic event. We must be confirmed that this is epileptic seizure. And we must weigh the risk between the drug and efficacy. So, uh, we need to decide what is the type of seizure, then what is the frequency and severity, and likelihood of relapse or remission, or precipitating factors, and the whether caregivers understand the risk and benefit. Next. So, before selecting AD, we must uh, see the patient profile, age, sex, weight, seizure type, syndrome types, comorbidities, and any systemic illness along with the epilepsy, whether there is any metabolic disorders like hepatotoxicity, then we will not go for sodium valproate. Whether there is any renal impairment, then we will not go for topiramate or zonisamide. So, associated comorbidities must be weighed. Next. For AIDS, for below six months, we do not prefer to give sodium valproate due to hepatotoxicity. And drug of choice is phenobarbitone, phenytoin, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and levetiracetam. And in older age, we also must check whether there is hyperactivity. If there is hyperactivity, we should not give phenobarbitone, clobazam, or levetiracetam. So, these are the factors you need to concern. Next slide. And we must also consider sex as phenytoin causes uh, gum hypertrophy due to cosmetic reason we will try to avoid phenytoin and sodium valproate is avoided in childbearing age due to neural tube defect incidence next then weight gain is also important in overweight, case, overweight cases we will not go for sodium valproate carmazepine or gabapentin and when there is weight loss, we will not go for topiramate, zonisamate, or felbamate, as these drugs cause weight loss. And if you like to keep weight neutral, then oxcarbazepine, levetiracetam, and lamotrigine is the drug of choice. So, next. So drug profile is also important, like tolerability, safety, and easy of administration, and pharmacokinetics. Cost is also important for Bangladesh. Because costly drugs sometimes, those they are very much effective, uh, patient may not afford. So this is important, and concomitant medication is also important. Next. So we need to uh, remember that certain drugs may cause exacerbation of seizure. So, for example, oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine may aggravate myoclonic seizure, absence seizure. So, aggravation of seizure we must take it in, into consideration. So, uh, whether there is high risk of AD in these seizures, we will avoid those drugs. Next. And etiology is also important. For example, in OH syndrome, if they present with tuberous sclerosis, then bigavitin is the drug of choice. And whether there is, when there is metabolic disturbances like non-ketotic hyperglycinemia, we should avoid sodium valproate. I think in all metabolic disturbances along with hyperammonemia, we should avoid sodium valproate. So this is also, also important. I am giving some examples of this etiology. Actually, there are a lot of things you need to consider regarding etiology. Caesar duration is also important. If Caesar persists more than five minutes, we need to give pyrectal diazepam or internasal midazolam. Actually, uh, pyrectal diazepam, it, is, it needs training, a brief training, then, then a mother can afford to give. And internasal uh, midazolam is not available in our country, but it can be imported from India. Uh, now it is available, but it is imported from India. Cost is 1,000 taka. Uh, so these two can be used for uh, prolonged seizure. Otherwise, actually the children needs hospitalization for prolonged, for the management of prolonged seizure. Because when this pyrectal diazepam doesn't control seizure, we need to give 
आई वी इंजेक्शन फेनिटोन और इंजेक्शन फेनोबर्बिटन और इवन इंजेक्शन मिराजोलम सो फॉर दैट वी नीड टू हॉस्पिटलाइज पेशेंट नीड्स ऑक्सीजन पेशेंट नीड्स अदर सपोर्ट्स फॉर दैट इन प्रोलॉन्ग सीजर इज वेरी मच स्टाफ टू मैनेज दैम इन द फील्ड लेवल इट इज बेटर टू हॉस्पिटलाइज सो एज आवर प्रीवियस स्पीकर मैंशन दैट Uh, if seizure persists more than 30 minutes, actually we will go for management of status epilepticus. Next. So when whenever we will uh, choose to give anti-epileptic drug, we must go for monotherapy. Man, monotherapy, and it should not be abandoned. Sometimes after giving monotherapy for few days, we stop that drug and go to another drug. It should not be, unless there is. ineffectiveness and for that we need to reach to the target dose unless there is side effects or any exaggeration of seizures in this cases we can go for second drug when there is ineffectiveness when there is side effects or exaggeration and uh, if the seizures are controlled with the second drug then first drug should be gradually withdrawn next and it uh, main principle in management of epilepsy is to start low and go slow to start with very much low doses low therapeutic doses and to go very slowly and not to go very rapid because sometimes if we go very rapidly if we increase the dose very rapidly we might face some increased skin rash like in lamotrigine we may get increased risk of cognitive impairment in case of topiramate and certainly there is less of effectiveness when you go very fast and there might be misinterpretation that this drug is not working actually this is due to going fast to increase the dose very rapidly so slow titration is very much important next when two monotherapy fails first line monotherapy then we can go for combination therapy next so we always consider a rational polytherapy and uh, it needs in one third of cases with children and in some cases like lenox gastro syndrome we may need to go for combination therapy in the very beginning like lenox gastro syndrome so uh, initially well selected two line Uh, second line fast drug is added to the agent that showed better efficacy and tolerability in monotherapy next and consideration prior to polytherapy before going to polytherapy we must consider whether our diagnosis is right we are going we are actually we are treating epileptic seizure not treating non epileptic seizure and uh, whether the drug choice is right whether we are giving a drug that is effective with general seizure we are giving that drug in focal seizure so type of seizure type of syndrome we must consider before going to combination therapy next so uh, it is clear that certain monotherapy is uh, contraindicated in some cases that i have already mentioned like uh, in absence seizure carbamazepine oxcarbazepine and we also consider non compliance sometimes patients will report that uh, seizure is not in control we will check that we will see that there is non compliance drugs were stopped and violation of imminent seizure precipitant effect is also important like video games sleep deprivation etc precipitant seizure another precipitant factor is fever so it may cause precipitation of seizure so before switching to another drug we must consider whether there is any imminent seizure precipitating factors next so when we will go for combination therapy we must choose different mechanism action of two drugs and we must prefer synergistic effects like valproate and lamotrigine have got synergistic effects and we will also consider side effect profile and there must not be any interaction and had an adjunctive effect next and certainly polytherapy more than three drugs is not advocated and 
we will get more adverse events than seizure control. So we will try to remain with two drugs, maximum three drugs. Next. So these are the, I am not going to detail of this mechanism of action, just showing that some are acting on sodium channel, some are acting on calcium channel, some are inhibitory, some are excitatory transmission. So whenever we will go for combination therapy, we will choose two drugs of different mechanism of action. Then we will get synergistic effects. So this is about older AD drugs, next. And this is about newer AD drugs. You see that different mechanism of action. So next. So the drug interaction, just you see in this figure that valproate is increasing phenobarbitan, phenito and carmazepine. On the contrary, phenobarbitan, phenito and carmazepine, as they are enzyme inducer, they will reduce the dose of drug level of sodium valproate. So we must consider the drug interaction and before giving combination therapy. Next. And sometimes if we face that we are uh, giving two or three drugs and there is possibility of giving one drug monotherapy, then we can switch over to monotherapy gradually. And sometimes there is better seizure control with monotherapy than polytherapy. And there are a lot of studies which have shown that uh, polytherapy can be switched to monotherapy. So that can be done and it's not that, that I, am, I have given already three drugs and I will go with these three drugs. No, we can try to reduce the number of drug. Next. So I am telling next some uh, drugs, about some drugs. Sodium valproate is very much effective in general seizure, absence seizure and myoclonic seizure. And doesn't aggravate seizure. This is one uh, advantage of sodium valproate. Next. And sodium valproate, even there is less risk in focal seizure like lamotrigine, topinamide and levetiracetam. There is less risk of aggravation of sodium valproate in case of focal seizure. Next. Next. Oxcarbazepine is very good drug for focal seizure and uh, you see that APKC is 79 percent with oxcarbazepine but with phenytoin 71 percent and with carmazepine 75 percent and in lamotrigine 66 percent. So in next slide. And by ILE, this oxcarbazepine is the first drug of size in focal seizure. And after oxcarbazepine comes carmazepine, phenobarbitin, phenytoin, topiramide, etc. Next. You see the uh, oxcarbazepine monotherapy discontinuation rate is very much low with oxcarbazepine, only 2 percent. But with phenytoin and oxcarbazepine, lamotrigine is more than 2 percent. Next. So there is less allergic reaction with oxcarbazepine than carbazepine. This is one advantage. Next. Mm, I will be talking on autism. First it was on cerebral palsy and next epilepsy. Now why autism? because I, am, I want to say something on autism. On autism ASD prevalence survey, a survey on young children, very young children, using health structure of government in Bangladesh. I can start now. So first we want to know what is autism. It's a very, I think, common term. Everybody has heard about the term autism. So autism it's a refers to a range of condition characterized by challenges with social smile, repetitive behavior, speech and nonverbal communication, as well as by unique strength and differences. So why, why we are keen to, I am keen to present in autism? Because the autism, number of autism is increasing day by day. And if we go through the slide, we can see the, the bar diagram that autism, there is tenfold increase of autism prevalence over the last, what's it, over the last 40 years, from 1995 to 2014. Hey, Next, next, please. Huh? 
এটা দিয়ে হবে না তো so in this slide we can read that autism is increasing day by day um, and uh, it's, a, it's a important public health concern and there's still a lot to learn why this is increased we know that uh, we have uh, diagnosed autism um, uh, well before that but even though there are many things that are to be disclosed and as Bangladesh is one of the very popular, densely pop populated country, so we think that uh, there might be a lot of children with autism. So Bangladesh is working as a role model. It is a role model in field of autism. We had the, in 2011, we have a regional program where very very prominent persons came and in this slide we can see Saima Wajad Hussain she is a she is working very hardly and she is nationally and internationally well renowned and also the daughter of our honorable prime minister and she has got many awards because of her relentless work in the field of autism for the well-being of the of people with autism Bangladesh government is also, as we have already learned from uh, from Dr. Dr. Gulam, that Bangladesh is working well on the, for for disability. And in 2013, two laws has been passed. On the one is and here we can see the disability right law, and the second one is neurodevelopmental disability protection. I want to make the second question to Dr. Gulam Khandokar that I just uh, picked one word that uh, you have mentioned in your uh, Shahjatpur you provide some community support services and others including some diets and uh, you just mentioned some uh, milk uh, products and some other things uh, definitely milk is very good for uh, nutrition of the cerebral palsy patients but there are some research that the gluten containing foods and the milk or casein containing foods those are uh, to some extent uh, triggering factor for cerebral palsy and others and some uh, researchers they are to treat the CP patients without uh, GFCF or that means gluten free and uh, casein free so have you explored that aspect or regarding the providing that service the dietary plan is there any dietary plan or not thank you I think the structure health structure is uh, the same in urban and rural but do you say the in the urban it's different no Different in the in two, yeah, yes, yes, yes. But yeah. In the urban, yes, yes. Yeah. From the from the hospital and the tertiary, yes. Yes, yes, yes. According to we use the design from the census from the census in 2011 and what they did we also did the same thing in the urban areas like in Dhaka metropolitan Chittagong we use the kisses huh? no, we not the structure we use the people in our our uh, study our health office uh, medical uh, health assistant they went door to door the first they selected the uh, the houses randomly selected the houses and they went th they visited this house but uh, you were you were right in the um, urban areas it was a bit difficult to enter into the um, this uh, um, uh, some of the houses like in the you know in the posh areas like in dhanmundi and this they didn't allow some sometime they didn't allow the visit the houses in that cases they took the second house but the number were more or less similar. I think that this, yeah, you can add. Thank you, ma'am, giving me the chance. Uh, we use not the structure, we use the uh, manpower of our DZ Health and also use the uh, manpower of local government for urban areas only. 
and we uh, divided the rules, um, same rules uh, between health assistant, health inspector of uh, DZ Health, and also the local local government uh, uh, local government employees. And they visited our uh, structured and our randomly selected houses, and they uh, collect the data. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I, I just want to add, actually, my understanding actually is that that was a cluster sampling. So that means actually out of 64 districts, 30 were chosen. And then out of the 30, actually, there, there were enumerated population actually in blocks, and they were chosen. That means actually both urban and rural population actually was equally represented. And the way they actually do, do actually in cluster sampling that we do, do don't knock. And if your one unit have 50 households, actually, it's like 50 households that opens the door. So that's how actually that the, all the cluster actually has equal opportunity if you have any bias to have door openers and non-openers. So that means actually the number you'll get actually is even. So that means you systematically exclude any bias into the study. So the number you are getting for urban and rural actually will not be that different from the reality. Because survey is always a survey. 70 urban 30 percent, yes. Yeah, yeah, but yes. Exactly, exactly. And, and ultimately, the prevalence that you'll get from urban and rural population, uh, survey number actually is not the gold standard one. Actually, gold standard is going door to door, every household. But I think what you'll get in a cluster uh, sample, sampling in a large survey is actually is very close to the re real number. So I think it's a strong uh, method of sampling, actually, what they have followed. Um, <laughs> so back to my question is so you ask a very important question that whether egg and milk contribute to uh, cerebral palsy and whether we have whether we have any diet planning dietary planning so I think that constitute more to autism um, with cerebral palsy actually what we have found as we've shown that 71.8 percent were malnourished and 73.2 percent were stunted and of those, actually, one third actually had severe acute malnutrition. Okay, and sad story actually I don't share with everyone is in last three years, out of 726 kids, we have lost 28 of our children, and of those 28, 88 percent actually has one thing in common that was malnutrition. So that's why actually, those are already diagnosed children with cerebral palsy. We have a nutritionist actually who is working closely to see their household food dynamics and food composition. And first thing actually we came up was to tackle the severeness of the and acuity of the malnutrition to throw something at them. And Shahjatpur being uh, a breach area with dairies and Bangladesh actually there is a poultry revolution so we found those two very easily accessible. So that's actually we headed towards milk and egg. Thank you.